Thank you very much. I am uh, unable to see past the first five rows. <laughs> Thank you very much, all of you, for coming. I, I understand that this room is packed, so probably just as well I can't see all of it. And it's an interesting dynamic uh, speaking here because somehow I feel that a standard of public performance may be required that I am unaccustomed to giving, seeing you all paid in. <laughs> Something I'm not actually, actually used to. But uh, Stephen, when Stephen asked me if I would, in fact, uh, give the Seamus Dean lecture tonight, I have to admit uh, two things. Uh, one, I owed a debt of uh, duty and gratitude to Stephen for his support for the, for the election here in Derry. And I owed a much longer standing debt uh, to, uh, to the late Brian Freel for, for, his, for his help many, many years ago. And I have to say, being asked uh, to, to in fact be part of the, the Seamus Dean lecture was so flattering I couldn't, couldn't really say no. So that's my excuse for being here and then having done it, I thought, that's maybe not the best thing you ever thought of, Bernadette, because I am, and as, as Michael very eloquently put it, I am indeed uh, much more accustomed to saying something because I think it has to be said and it has to be said now because something needs to be done now and everybody else has the wit to keep their mouths shut for a bit, so I find myself making the noise. That's kind of been the history. So I tend to speak on, on very immediate issues uh, in a campaigning sense. So it's a bit of a challenge for me to say, well, what am I going to tell these people that I haven't already burnt the ears of Kitty Holland with when a woman's trying to do what was an excellent interview and uh, I, if she's here tonight, thank you, Kitty, and uh, for her kindness and patience in listening, you know, to a veteran of the struggle rambling on and then extracting from it uh, uh, a very coherent and, and, uh, and kind interview. The problem, of course, is that once I've said it to Kitty Holland, it's now all gone out of my mind, same as, as, as if I wrote notes, so I'm probably going to talk about something entirely different. But uh, as, as I was sort of driving here earlier in the day, uh, two things that, that, that struck me, I was listening to uh, an item just on, on the news, uh, and it was quite immediate but very interesting, that 60% of the population, according to recent research, 60% of the population of Northern Ireland do not have oh, more than a hundred pounds in savings. Sixty percent of the Northern Ireland population don't have what my mother used to call a roughness of one hundred pounds. Now a number of years ago I, I remember being aware that just over fifty percent of the population of Northern Ireland didn't have access to £300 saving. And I was really shocked just to hear that on, just hear that short item on the news, it was about debt, that as we have progressed in the millennium, that's, that's how far we've progressed. That whatever number of years that was, maybe 10, maybe 20, that people are now in increased poverty, and, and many, many people in this room will know like what a hundred pounds is. A hundred pounds would scarcely today buy an average family a week's groceries. A hundred pounds actually is 20 pounds short of the rent on a three-bedroomed three house in Dungannon for a week. So you don't have to fall very far you don't have to get into any great depth of hardship, you know. If your washing machine and your cooker 
broke at the same time, your savings would be gone in getting both of them functioning again. And that's, that's the north of Ireland that we live in. That's the model of conflict resolution and <coughs> peace and prosperity and progress that we're hawking around the world for everybody else to follow. And sometimes I th think there has to be an international trading standards somewhere <coughs> that we're in breach of. You know, there has to be somebody there has to be somebody buying these packages who, who has recourse to some kind of trading standards agency that says I've, be, I've, been, I've been conned. Uh, because the other thing that I heard on the news, and, and I'm sure most of you will have heard it as well, is about the company Nyko. Somebody probably got a lot of money in coming up with the title that probably cost about £10,000, probably went out to tender and, and probably 20 different groups applied and then somebody got £10,000 of public money to think of a name for a Northern Ireland peace selling company and they said, oh, mm, oh, and they, mm, and then they, mm, and then they came up with NICO. Northern Ireland Company. <laughs> that's, wh that's where your taxes goes. But NICO is actually a subsidiary company of Invest Northern Ireland. Invest Northern Ireland is an arm's length company of the Department of Trade and Industry. So the Department of Trade and Industry gives the money to Invest NI, and Invest NI, they gave the money to NICO, and NICO are helping to sell the piece to, I think it might be Saudi Arabia. <laughs> I think it's Saudi Arabia. I think it might also maybe include a bit of help for the Sultan of Oman, I'm not sure. But NICO are actually training prisoners and police officers in these countries as to how to be like the PSNI. Well, I presume, what else would they know? <laughs> how to manage their prisons the way we manage Magabre. You can see why we need it. Trades Description Act to protect these torturous, anti-democratic, human rights violating states from the con men of the peace process of Northern Ireland. But there's no end to it. The Northern Ireland peace process takes the credit for ending years and years of conflict in Colombia the Colombian state and FARC. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I do uh, have a certain degree of sympathy with, uh, with Jim Allister's Marlene concept. <laughs> that uh, I remember myself, me, myself, and I, the three of us used to go to America. <laughs> and it occurred to me that I was actually making more socialists in the United States than I was making back here. I was actually making more progress in, in radicalizing people in the States than here. And that may well be the case, that the peace looks better the further from here you get. <laughs> because certainly it doesn't look great from here. If the reality of life in Northern Ireland is that 60% of the people that's the majority of the population. Have less than a week's wages, less than a week's family benefit between them and penury. That, to me, is absolutely incredible. 
So I think the question we have to ask is one, how did we get here uh, as far as Northern Ireland is concerned? How did we, and, and then I should say not how did we, how did the rest of you, not me, how did the rest of you ever believe that the, the secret process of unelected people behind closed doors would lead to a solution that would be in the interest of the majority of the population. There's a certain logic there. If I had an idea that I thought you would all love, I would tell you all about it. There's no point in me having an idea that I think you would all love and keeping it a secret in case you didn't like it. <laughs> so the only purpose of having secret talks around conflict is if the people having the talks don't actually believe that they can easily sell the concept to the people they have to sell it to. And it's a very age-old ploy. It's not something that just happens here. It happens everywhere. That people are drawn into private and secret conversations. And they kind of work on the basis, not unlike why I'm standing here tonight. People get flattered. So I don't know if any of you remember, but there was a time when, for example, the IRA were terrorists. And then over a period of time, somewhere around the period of the mid-80s after the uh, Anglo-Irish Agreement and heading into the 90s, people started using phrases like sophisticated. The IRA might be terrorists, but they were amongst the most sophisticated terrorists in the world. You would see a couple of dairy backs straightening there. <laughs> mm. Sophisticated terrorists. That's what we are. Strategic thinker. Tom Hartley. I knew we were not going well when Tom Hartley was described as a strategic thinker. <laughs> and the poor man from the Irish press who so described him, I began to think, there's something wrong there. <laughs> Tim Pat Coogan has lost the run of himself. <laughs> because Tim Pat Coogan was no mean thinker. What he described, my good friend, former friend Tom, as a strategic thinker. When I challenged Tom on this possible description, he said, Burned it, the problem with you is that you don't know how to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. <laughs> <laughs> Tom was nothing if he, if he wasn't humorous and, and witty. And, uh, and then he went on to say, you're missing the necessity. You don't, can't follow the fancy footwork. Oh, I said, that's, that's all right, Tom. OK, you dance over there. <laughs> but you could see how the flattery began to work. We now had strategic thinking. Jerry Adams was almost of statesman-like stature. He was still, he was still an outsider. Uh, I remember people who, who indicated that they could do with a little help, maybe, from a strategic thinker like me. And uh, I can be flattered by my friends. I have been blessed with an inability to be flattered by mine enemies. <laughs> so, when I found strange people saying maybe I wasn't as bad as they had thought I was, I knew there was a problem here. <laughs> so I, I just usually said, look, I'll, I'll talk to you about that next week. But bit by bit, what actually happened, the people 
in the Republican movement, used to demonization and alienation, uh, found themselves flattered by new descriptions and a belief that, that they were winning. These new you know, delusions set in. This realization on the part of the British government and the British military and the United States government and the Irish government that Sinn Féin and the IRA were maybe right. That, that was proof positive that the campaign was working, that the military campaign was working. They had shown the British who wasn't afraid of them. They could take the fight to the British government. And this had brought the government to the realization that there was a stalemate. That the British Army, Her Majesty's Armed Forces, Her Royal Britannic Majesty, Queen Elizabeth II, that in 2016 still has managed personally to hold on to 6,600 million acres of the entire world had been fought to a standstill by a couple of hundred people on the island of Ireland and forced to the negotiating table. What possessed you to believe that? What possessed people to believe that story was true? It's not that people were stupid. Because people would not own up to the truth. People were war weary of a war of attrition that was beginning to take the second generation of their children before the first generation of their children had left the prisons. And out of loyalty to the IRA, they wouldn't dare say that out loud. Enough people said it quietly to them, including myself, including Des Wilson, including Oliver Kearney, including almost everybody holding the line in communities and holding them together. But out of loyalty, nobody said it out loud. Nobody would be the pe person to publicly say, this military campaign needs to be unilaterally ended to give the rest of us room to move. In fact, I think maybe Michael Farrell very bravely set that conversation out within the broad family of, of resistance. And if there is one thing, I know there are plenty of things that plenty of people will not forgive Martin McGuinness or Jerry Adams or the list just gets longer. But if there's one thing that I will not excuse them, because I don't know what forgiveness is, the one thing that I do not excuse them, it is that at the point when a number of people, including myself, were saying it is in the interest of the population, it is in your interest, it is in our interest, that you consider a unilateral ceasefire. Nobody puts it on you that you say in all of this conversation that you believe it's in the interest of the people, particularly after the period uh, of the hunger strike and then the Good Friday or, or the, the Anglo-Irish agreement and a realization. And I remember the words that, that I used to them was the present generation of people that you are drawing into the IRA are little more than children who are confessing their guilt on the curb before the police put them in the, in the jeep. Not being, not being tortured in prison. They're confessing on the curb at the point of arrest. And that was clear. So why are, you do, why are you doing that? And the answer that I got was, go home. <laughs> That's what they said, go home, Bernadette. 
And of course, you know, nobody ever got to talk to the IRA. You talked to people who had an, underst an insight. I have to get this phrase right. You forget it. The people who had an insight into the thinking of the IRA. I remember having a conversation once with Seamus Costello during my short but very educational membership of the IRSP. And there was a similar kind of conversation where in absolute frustration I said to Seamus, Seamus, please do me a favor. Would you go into that men's toilet there? And while you're in there and the door closed behind you, would you have a conversation with the chief of staff of the INLA? <laughs> And when you come out, <laughs> would you tell me what he said <laughs> so that I can understand where I stand in this organization? And, and uh, he just looked at me, as he often did, and, and, and said things like, close the door with, behind you, burned it on the way out. So I think the, the point that I'm making here is that nobody sets out, nobody really sort of sets out to end up where they end up. I don't believe that Sinn Féin and the Republican movement, when they set out, actually set out to be where they are now. I don't believe that. I believe it's, it's a, if you put a very s simple analysis of it, if you lifted a frog and threw it in a pot of boiling water, the instinct of the frog is to immediately jump out and it is virtually unscathed. If you put it in cold water and turn the heat up slowly, you get boiled frog. It gets comfortable. Mm. <laughs> Mediterranean style water. And by the time, by the time the water's too hot for it to survive, it, it no longer knows how to get out. And I think that in a way, that's where we are in the politics of the North. Not only do we have Sinn Féin in government. And my problem is not that nationalist Sinn Féin or Irish nationalist Sinn Féin is in government with British nationalist DUP. It's not the coalition. It's not the ability of these people to work together that upsets me. It's the things on which they agree that upset me. It's the things that they can do together, the fundamental things that bring them together, that are more important to them than their, the, the different aspects of their various nationalist outlooks. That's what worries me about the future. But not only have, have they got themselves there in this bizarre belief, and they both have this biz bizarre belief that Martin is in there, and the party, as part of the project. There's a whole new language here you have to learn. The party's there as part of the project, and the project is the same as the project always was. So when you're remembering the 1916 Rising, if you're making a funding application, it was a project. <laughs> 19, uh, it may have been a field project. I don't know whether they had to give any money back or not. But in this language, the 1916 rebellion was a project, a project to unite Ireland. And that project is ongoing and carried forward by Sinn Féin. And that project is on track. And the logic is, the logic is very simple. How do we know it's on track? Well, Sinn, Sinn Féin are in government in the north, albeit with the DUP and albeit in order to stay in government with the DUP, moving further and further and further to the social and economic right. That's the price, that's the price they're paying and the price they are willing to pay. But they're in government, so the project's all right. And they're in opposition, so they're in the doll. They're in the opposition and on their way to government in the South. And Sinn Féin are the people because they're the Republican Party. And this is a Republican project. So Sinn Féin are the people. And so if Sinn Féin are in government in the North, 
and on their way to government in the south, then Ireland's as good as free. Because when Sinn Féin is in the government on the both sides, the people will be in the government on the both sides. So it'll be the same thing as having a united Ireland. <laughs> because the same people will be running the two sides of it. Now you begin to open up the mental health debate at this point. <laughs> because politically, what you have to do to get to a point that that is a coherent argument. And it's a bit like if you go back and remember the, the time of the Birmingham Six, when the judge said to believe that to believe that the police had behaved that they had, to believe that there had been a conspiracy to convict people who were innocent was such an appalling vista, it couldn't be true. And the appalling vista has, has a great hold on all of us. It was too appalling a vista and remains for many people too appalling a vista to think to even begin to think that after half a century almost now of struggle, this whole thing screwed up. The price paid for it. The people dead. The people killed. The generations traumatized. The population whose mental health is in serious question. The hunger strikes and all the hidden bits, all the other bits that come through secrecy, all the internalized bits, the abuse of authority within the communities, be that the IRA, the UDA, the police, the parish priest, all the people who suffered underneath that conflict it hardly bears thinking about that it might have been for nothing. That's an appalling vista. That's enough to paralyze your thinking for about 10 years. That's enough to fill you with such despair and such anger, such despondency, that when people say it's not working, we should try something else, you either refuse to believe it's not working because you can't go there or you do believe it and so you give up entirely. And I think that that's where people have been uh, for a period of time. And I think some people are still there because where we're looking at now is we have a political party formed called Siru. Good luck to us, boys. Because if you couldn't see it the first time, and I've seen them all, no harm to you. See all these heroes that have formed Siru, which is a change from Sir Olu, which was a change from Sir Era, which was, see, this group of people, they all bought into the peace process at the beginning. And at the next bit, and at the next bit, and at the next bit. And the bit they fell out, to my memory, was over the police. And now they're all going back to say, no, Sinn Féin sold us out, so what will we do? We're going to form a party that looks very like Sinn Féin. Well, about 10 years ago, and we're going to repeat the same thing again. And I have to ask a question. Einstein asked it, and he was marginally more clever than me. Sorry about that, I was only thinking out loud there. <laughs> Einstein asked, he put a proposition that insanity was doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So at what time and in what place in our history from 1798 onwards are we going to step back and look and say, 
the model of political organising doesn't work. That that concept of saying that we have basically a, a republican philosophy that in its context here, and I'm not talking about the wider concept of republican as a democratic ideal, but republicanism as it has grown and generated here within a, a, a kind of mishmash of populism, radicalism, nationalism that is tied around freeing the nation first and then looking at the social policy second. That is tied around a belief that in order to progress the democratic project, the independence project, you must simultaneously have an open democratic party and then a secret army up your sleeve. That's the way it works. It doesn't work. It didn't work. It never worked. And it never will. It doesn't work. And part of the reason it doesn't work is secrecy doesn't work. You cannot build a democratic movement through secrecy. You cannot win a democratic argument without open debate and discussion. You cannot actually hold and sustain progress without the support of the people. You can't do it for them. You can't win freedom for people and hope they'll pat you on the back and take it and look after it for you. And at some point, that has to be faced in this country. And you can see the limitations of where it works. In my place of work, I have met people who come in to complain. They have to see burned it. I want to see burned it. There's about 30 people work in our place, but everybody has to see burned it. <laughs> and when people say, I have to see burned it, everybody else in the place says, yeah, because they know there's no good coming of this meeting. <laughs> These people are in to find out what burned it's going to do about the foreigners, because it's burned its fault. She brought them here. People ring me up and say, are you responsible for the Portuguese? <laughs> nope, absolutely not. Are you, uh, are you responsible for them, foreigners? And, and the kind of conversation sometimes you get from people who fought for their own rights is we didn't fight for equality here for them to come over here and benefit. <laughs> we didn't fight for equality here for them to, come o them to come over and get the benefit of it. It's our, it's our equality. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Rights. Rights. We didn't fight for our rights for them to come over here and take our jobs. And I have a very simple philosophy, I always say, right, tell me which job did somebody, because that has been my life's work, tell me which job you were entitled to that somebody stole from you and you and I will go and get it back <laughs> right now. <laughs> then you discover, no, I didn't apply for the job. I'm only, make, I'm only making the point. I said, well, why didn't you? Because if that's your problem, we can help you apply for jobs. I've got a job. I'm, that's not your, you're only twisting my arguments again. And, and so we've got this very narrow vision. And part of me is fed up hearing about this place. Part of me is bored beyond sanity. 
about hearing about Jerry Adams and the badness of him. And Martin McGuinness and the badness of him. And the petty squabbles for petty parochial power in petty little fiefdoms while the world is burning round us. Part of me is so frustrated with this place's obsession with its own navel. Because I go back to say that there are people in Northern Ireland, and I know exactly what that is, and that's crucial for me, who live precarious lives just on the edge of poverty. But there are millions of people in the world who don't know where the next dollar is, not the next $50. People fleeing war and that chaos. And I kind of think, was when I looked at the, the, this debate or the, this discussion and, and, and I said to Stephen, what about terrible state of chassis? It was because I'd been in a conversation around the John Hewitt School of how O'Casey must have felt, how, how the people must have felt after the 1916 rising, after the War of Independence, when, when it was all falling apart, when it all looked like chaos to them. And how would they make it a century later when they're looking to see how little real, and I'm not saying that we haven't made progress, but the, the chaos that is the world. And then I thought, actually, chaos is only a point of view. We think and we understand and we perceive the system to be broken. People aren't sure how to fix it, but they know that it's broken. Because it's not working for them. But if you took a different point of view, systems work imperfectly. The system never was working better. The system was never intended to work for you. You exist to work for the system. That's all. You exist to work for the system. And the system needs some of you to be unemployed and some of you to be homeless and some of you to be working. And some of you to be fighting over who is employed and who isn't. And some of you to be confused and believe that the reason you're working and he's not or she's not or they're better off than you is because your religion or your color or your gender or your sexual orientation is different from theirs. And so we battle around a demand for an equality of injustice an equality of poverty, an equality of misconception. When, in reality, slightly more, I think this room holds, somebody said about 250 people. Imagine it held 50 people more. This whole room held 300 people. There are 300 people in the world. They all have names. They're real people. And between the 300 of them, they own as much of the world's wealth as 300 million of the poorest people in the world. So, if you kind of fill this bit of this floor with another 50 people, we have a world in which a room full of people own as much of the world's wealth as the entire population of North America, China, and Brazil put together. And we never look at that inequality. 
We never look at a world where we think we have democracy. But as I say, that woman that my mother, because she was a good person, said was a noble and gracious lady. I repeat, there are things I insist on repeating at every meeting. My mother said the Queen of England was a noble and gracious lady. And my father said that might be so. She is also the inheritor of a butcher's apron and a receiver of stolen goods. <laughs> I had a good education as a child. <laughs> and the other is never to me leave a meeting without mentioning Leon Trotsky and working towards his rehabilitation in the revolution. <laughs> in which point I'd like to own up that I voted for Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> and and they never managed to out me as a trot <laughs> or a former member of the Irish Republican Socialist Party and therefore not allowed to vote. Uh, so, so the trots got voting for, for Jeremy. But the point, the point I think that I want to make about the system and the new conversations we need to have is that we are still fighting an old argument on old lines and old ways that have shown not to work. While increasingly and inevitably, the world as a single place in that whole global question is coming down to the basic question. And the survival of this planet is caught up in that question. Socialism or barbarism? And we're watching barbarism. What kind of world looks at people drowning in the Mediterranean and says, it's not my fault? What kind of world looks at people backed up in Cali and the best we can do is organize rucksacks so that when they have to leave the camp, they can take their belongings with them? And I'm not knocking that because I'm part of doing it. But is that the only solution we've got? Her Majesty the Queen, that noble and gracious lady, owns 6,600 million acres of the world. The Pope, one of the last remaining monarchs along with Her Majesty the Queen, he owns 177 million acres in the world. In fact, the king of Saudi Arabia, he's the next on the list. He apparently owns about 253,000 million acres. Five people between them own more than half the world. So maybe the questions that we need to start looking and the conversations we need to have should no longer be about the project of nationalism, but should be about the project of land. As a rural person, I keep telling you land is important. Who owns the land owns what is built on it, owns what is dug out of it. And increasingly, fewer and fewer people own the land that is this planet. Fewer and fewer people own the water that is this planet. And when we have human rights conversations, we talk about the right to vote. Soon you can vote whatever way you like, because it will have no bearing on the politics of the world. No bearing at all. You vote for governments that are powerless. If governments weren't becoming powerless, they wouldn't let reprobates like Sinn Féin in, and they wouldn't let women be leading governments. The system is working. It is simply not working for us. So we need new conversations. Human rights should not simply be about our political rights, our civil rights. And I'm not quite sure if we have national rights or community rights 
in the way that we think we have. But we have got to fight for human rights as an economic concept. If we have a right to live, and if we have a right to life, then we must have a right to the resources by which we can survive. And to have a right to those resources, we must have ownership of land, ownership of water, and ownership of the means of production of wealth. Now, there are ways we can get that. We can go toe to toe and fight for it. We have nothing to fight with. You cannot take the Michael Collins model of guerrilla action against people who can eradicate cities from the sky. You cannot win the battle of Aleppo with a Thompson submachine gun and a military secret organization any more than you could win this one. So we have to start where we are and build new conversations. New conversations about who is stealing our resources. Not about whether Martin McGuinness is a good nationalist or a good Republican. The man is in government and he needs to be held to account. And as a man in government held to account, he has to answer to us. If there are insufficient resources in the north of Ireland such as it is, so that the people only have a hundred pounds spare cash between them and starvation, that the housing crisis is worse than it was in the 1960s. That people now have work, but the work doesn't pay. So the working population are eating out of food banks. Why is this man reducing corporation tax from 28% in his mind to 10 or 12? These are the issues that we have to take up and these are the issues we have to fight. There's a new conversation and it has to be about extending human rights to economic rights. It has to be about building communities that are sustainable culturally, health-wise, socially, economically. It has to be about a participative democracy. And when I say that, there's always a contradiction. I'm going to end on it. I refuse to leg it with the Brits. Sorry about that. I have been rendered, not for the first time, as a not very serious socialist and possibly not worthy of the name because I voted to remain in the European Union. The last time I transgressed so seriously it was because in the 19, early 1970s when I should have been proselytizing for the revolution, I went to watch Muhammad Ali fight in Madison Square Gardens. <laughs> <laughs> I am as unrepentant about voting remain as I am about going to see Muhammad Ali. But what did happen there, and, and I argued at the start, our position should always have been that it wasn't about staying in or getting out. It was about understanding that we were between a rock and a hard place. I disagreed with the vote because I think the people took a very uninformed vote. And I think the majority of the people who did vote to get out voted for not very progressive reasons. But it was an exercise in participative democracy. It was a bit like release unto us Barabbas. Not the smartest move you might have made. <laughs> think, what, think what we could have been spared if they had actually not voted to get Barabbas out and taken the other guy. <laughs> Just think what the world would have been spared. But in closing, what I do want to say is it's a new, we have got to let go of an old conversation. And I don't mean when I say that, that we've got to let go of the fight for justice, of the right to hold to account those who have to be held to account within the state for Bloody Sunday, for Bally Murphy. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about an endless argument about what Sinn Féin might have done and could have done and didn't have done and somebody else might do around a methodology of organizing 
that no longer works, about a narrow conversation that in today's world hardly even matters because nation states are merely the puppets of corporate organizations and we are in the process of seeing both north and south of seeing this nation sold into the hands of those corporate powers without so much as a whisper. Meetings like this start this conversation and, and people like people before profit start this conversation. So maybe that's where we need to start organizing, putting the people first, challenging the corporate profiteers and starting a new conversation because this is the last conversation in which I ever intend to mention Jerry Adams again. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.